So, Marielle Schacher, uh, welcome to Fort Wayne, and uh, on behalf of all of us at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, we're just delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. The pleasure and honor is all mine. It's really nice to be in this welcoming, very nice, and kind people. Well, we're, we're delighted to have you here. You know, uh, Mariella, your story is so compelling and inspiring. And uh, uh, so I want to ask you just a, a few questions about, you know, just uh, your, your uh, biography. Tell us a little bit about how you took up the violin as a young girl. I think it was 10 years old. I was 10, yes, when I started. So in Syria, we start the first year. Um, we learn the theory of music, like solfege, how to read. And during that first year, um, we get to decide whether we would like to learn piano, trumpet, violin. Um, my passion was actually the piano, but it was very expensive for my parents to afford, so somehow they convinced me with the violin. But the first month when I started learning, I just, you know, loved it so much. I loved how you can create the tone, how you can express yourself in playing even like, you know, two lines of music. And somehow I decided this is what I would like to take as a profession and passion in my life. And so it was your mother. It was your mother who convinced you to take right, up the violin right. along with your own love of the violin. Yes, yes. She wanted to do violin herself when she was young, but she did not have the opportunity to pursue this. You know, in the West, we have many stereotypes of the Middle East, but we have many stereotypes of Syria. <clears throat> and and uh, we know just from the little time we've spent together how much you love your country. You love Syria. Tell us about Syria, something maybe we don't know about in the West, but tell us something about Syria uh, um, and, and things that we Americans need to know about it that would break some of our stereotypes. Yeah, Syria. Syria is a very old and ancient country. Aleppo, for example, it's one of the oldest cities in the world. It's filled with culture and history. People there are warm, kind, welcoming. Um, and it's just devastating to see what they're going through, what's happening there. Um, I was born and raised in, in Syria all my life, and I moved to the U.S. when I was 23 years old. Um, and I miss it so much. I, I dream about the day when I could just show up there and go back to see my friends and my people there. When I lived in Jordan, there were a number of Iraqi refugees and then also later Syrian refugees mm -hmm. in Jordan. And they, uh, <clears throat> the Jordanian people, of course, are known for their education and their culture. But the Iraqi refugees and the Syrian refugees really brought with them uh, ancient culture and traditions, especially in the arts. Right. Right, yeah. Music, classical music, for example, it's not so popular there, but they also have the Middle Eastern music, folk music, which I'm going to perform today. The last piece, uh, it's a folk Middle Eastern piece, and I will dedicate it to Syria. Wonderful. So even with your love of Syria and the people in Syria, you, you had to make the difficult choice a number of years ago to flee the war that was consuming uh, your hometown of Aleppo. And can you tell us a little bit about that choice and then how you were able to do it? Right. It was a very critical decision because I am very attached to my parents, especially my mom. She is my role model. She's my closest friend. And I wanted to dream to have tomorrow. I wanted to have future. I wanted to be able to feel that I'm doing something meaningful there. Uh, in Syria, I was playing uh, at venues while, you know, there were bombs just falling everywhere. But I kept going. I wanted to make music. I wanted to feel alive. And I wanted to spread joy and hope for people around me. But I reached to a point where I felt, well, that's not enough. 
things are not going to improve. And by staying here, I'm not doing any improvement. I, I wanted to do something for myself to be able to be a giver to, to others. So um, I kept searching online for opportunities. Uh, I was running from Internet Cafe to another. Um, for six months, all what I thought about, like, to find a way. I applied, like, at 60 or 70 places in all over Europe, in the U.S., schools. in Australia, yeah, schools. And once a miracle happened that uh, one of the schools that I was in touch with, they bombed the University of Aleppo, and I was there. I was trying to collect my diploma, and a day later... I received an email from one of these schools. She was asking me, uh, are you alive? What's happening? And I thought, well, she must be a very special woman to think about me. I'm sure they get, you know, tons of applications every year. So I wanted to go there. I wanted to go to that school. So the name of that woman is Brain Tooley. She is now a very co close friend. She was in charge of the international students at Monmouth. Monmouth. Monmouth College in Illinois. Um, so I told her, uh, I would love to come to your school and I will do whatever it takes. I sent her my application, everything, all the supporting documents, some videos from uh, my previous concerts in Syria. And they were impressed. They wanted to, to have me as part of the orchestra there. And it worked out, but it was a very, very hard decision because I said goodbye to my mother, not knowing if there will be another hello. And that was just heartbreaking for me, being too close to them, leaving them in such a horrific condition without electricity, without water, under bombs falling everywhere. So I couldn't see them for the first four years in, in the U.S. I want you to say a word about your music. <clears throat> your, your life's work, as you describe it, is nothing less than to heal the world. Yeah, that's very true. And, and, and I want to read a couple of quotes of yours, uh, and then I want you to just respond. And take your time in responding. <clears throat> music is a very powerful language. It removes barriers between people and nations. For me, it was the bridge that carried me from the war to the United States. It saved my life. The second one, I am a Christian who has performed Jewish themes like Schindler's List for Muslim communities. And you use that as an example of the bridge building that you hope for your music. Right. S say a word about each one of those, would you please? Yes. How music saved your life. It did save my life, for sure, because I also have a degree in business administration and economy from Syria. I studied at the University of Aleppo, but it was music that somehow uh, exposed me to the world. It introduced me to the U.S. and made people, you know, more passionate about what's happening in our countries. I go to a lot of places, and um, some people, they don't know anything about Syria, what's going there? Some people are extremely Republicans. And somehow they feel for what's happening in our countries. They feel for the people there. And uh, just amazing to be able to um, change the way people think and make them uh, more aware of issues that our world, our world is facing. So that's what you mean when you say music is a very powerful language. It's a very powerful language. It connects people from different backgrounds, from different cultures. And I feel that history repeats itself. We had the Holocaust over 100 years ago. And now we have another Holocaust uh, in Syria and, and now Ukraine. So somehow when you hear that music, you relate to these people, hoping that we could learn something, we could... If not, if we haven't learned, like you know, to stop war because this is something beyond our ability, we could at least connect, reunite, 
relate to what's happening and feel the pain of others. I am a Christian who performs Jewish themes like Schindler's List for Muslim communities. That's an example, isn't it, of this bridge building? Right, indeed. I have been born and raised in a Christian family who taught me that loving Jesus is loving your neighbor. And uh, this is what I would like to pass on to the next generation. Um, before the war in Syria, uh, Muslims and Christians, at least this is what my mom has taught me, we used to share our uh, ceremonies together, Adha, Christmas, Ramadan, and Easter. And after the war, my parents, they even shared their bread and water with our Muslim neighborhoods and neighbors. This is what we would like to save. This is what we would like to carry on and teach uh, others. So much of your work has been done in the West particularly among you know, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim audiences, uh, just because of your background, your own uh, biography. I'm wondering, have you, how do you, have you connected with any Hindu or Buddhist or other Eastern religious uh, uh, traditions, and how has that gone? Or do you have any experiences you'd like to share? No, actually, my, my experience is, is so limited in that aspect. But now, uh, living in London, I have the chance to work with a lot of... Uh, students, violin students who are Hindu, so I am, I am eager to learn more about them and uh, develop my knowledge about these people and how we can also connect with music together. Reading about you and reading some of your interviews and now having had conversations with you for a day, <clears throat> I think that you would find a ready audience and your message would resonate very well with uh, Hindu communities and especially and, and Buddhist communities too. While you love Syria very much, and it's a part of the very marrow of your being, you speak with equal affection about the United States. Talk to us about America and the opportunities you've uh, found here your education uh, at Monmouth and DePaul, to the awards you've received, uh, to the places you've performed. America really has a deep place in your heart, doesn't it? Yes, I love the United States very much and its people. <clears throat> it's certainly the place that I could call home now. Um, I am so touched uh, with the people that I have met, my professors at Monmouth, Carolyn, Suda, David Suda, Tim Pell, uh, all the entire Monmouth community, how welcoming they were. Um, they offered us not only education, but also a warm and safe home to flourish. And this is all what we needed. Like they welcomed 18 Syrian students. 18? 18 Syrian students for such a small liberal arts school. It was amazing wow. thing. Um, and apart from that, this is all what we needed. I mean, more than the ed education, of course, ed education was very much needed, but, you know, sense of friendship and sense of family and community, this what, you know, changed our lives the most, uh, to, to, to be able to form that home again, away from home. You have, uh, um so Monmouth really did stamp America. I mean, that became a kind of a microcosm of America to you. Yeah. And then you've performed all around the United States, and I hope you've e experienced that warmth wherever you've gone. Very much. At every place I have, you know, I have a memory I would like to share with the world. It's, it's wonderful. It truly was an amazing journey. Um, I traveled a lot of places, and every place I have a story to tell. Um, and I was humbled to be honored at the White House as champion of change for world refugees by President Obama. And I truly consider this is a huge responsibility because I would like to be an ambassador for Syria in the U.S. and conversely represent all what I've learned here worldwide. So, uh, uh, champion of change, President Obama, President George H.W. Bush, a point of light, mm -hmm. and you say that that's, that's a great responsibility that you have. 
do you do you speak and share your music on behalf of those? How does that work? In other words, you just take that with you now, and wherever you go, you're an ambassador for these two uh, awards that you've received. Not just these these two. No, others as well. Yes, oh, I'm uh, I'm a high profile supporter for the UN Refugee Agency, and my role is to show the world that refugees are normal people who have dreams and ambitions. <clears throat> They're not a burden. They're displaced people who are eager to find that second chance the opportunity and I would like to show the world and the US that um, it would be great you know to have these people to um, to give them that chance I know from people who arrived here um, as students like me they graduated and they went on to do wonderful things they are working at Harvard some of them they're studying at MIT so they're not a burden they're not coming you know to cause harm or threat but they only need that opportunity to have their life back and to contribute also to their new uh, countries. Uh, yeah, I want to say a little bit more. I want you to say a little bit more about your work with uh, on behalf of refugees. Um, you not only do that in the U.S., but you do that throughout Europe as well. Right. And so, I mean, uh, we hear we hear all kinds of stories about how refugees are accepted or not accepted, not only here, but in the UK, right. in Germany, and other European countries. So tell us a little bit about your work, not only in America, but in Europe as well on behalf of refugees. Yes, so um, I work mostly with the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR. Uh, before COVID, we were so active in having like uh, events, private events, uh, with Kate Blanchett, Angelina Julie, Ben Stiller, Meryl Streep. We traveled together at like four or five places in LA, San Francisco, Hong Kong, New York twice. And we were able just to make salon events to share poetry, music, art, spoken words, just to let people know who we are, what we do. Um, share stories about refugees, the struggle they they endure, um, all these things which people need to know, need to hear, and they react, they donate, they go on to help, they um, you know take on missions to support these pe people on the borders, for example, Jordan and Lebanon. Um, so I, I I'm I'm fortunate that I am able to do this along with these. Uh, powerful and um, uh, amazing people. In one event, once we were able to raise over one million uh, U.S. dollars to that? support UN Refugee Agency. Where was that? 2019. <coughs> and that was where? In this was in New York. New York. When you say when you say that we traveled together, you reference these celebrities, right? But who? Who else, in addition to you, were there other uh, yes. musicians, poets, yes. artists who traveled with you? Yeah, you? there is a, a very good uh, a poet. She's a friend of mine. Her name is Amy Mahmoud. She is also a, a refugee. Um, she's been living here for quite a long time. She, she was a refugee. There is also another uh, young man who, who was a refugee from Iraq. So it's a combination between these celebrities and refugees who um, are speaking on behalf of other refugees. It's not only a great responsibility because of these awards that you've received from these presidents and other organizations, but I imagine you feel the, the weight of giving voice to all these people who are fleeing from their homes right. with virtually nothing with them other than what they can carry in trying to establish homes in yeah. a new land. I've just heard today that over 100 million people are displaced now. It's just like this market yesterday. Uh, that's massive amount of people. And it's, it's heartbreaking to see this figure. You know, in this country, in addition to Syrian refugees, now Ukrainians, and uh, we've had Burmese 
uh, here in Fort Wayne quite a bit. But in this country, as you know, there are a lot of refugees at our southern borders. Right. Coming from Central and South America. Yeah. Fleeing, f fleeing for their lives. Indeed. Do you, uh, uh, is that a part of your work as well? In other words, when, you, when you're speaking on behalf of refugees, they're part of, they're, they're part of your consciousness as you speak as well, right? Of course, yes. Especially that I still have relatives <clears throat> and friends in Syria. Until now, they struggle without water or electricity or internet, something we really take for granted. We never think about these things in the U.S., for example, or in the U.K. So it's just, um, it's just hard for me to think that I am here and they're there. We cannot communicate much. They cannot live a normal life. Um, it's very sad. I was particularly moved, I mean, of course, your eye catches Kate Blanchett, Meryl Streep, and others, George H.W. Bush, Barack Obama. But I was particularly struck by the fact that you received uh, an Anne Frank Promise Keeper Award. Tell us about that, how that came to be, and what that has meant to you. Um, I performed Schindler List many times. And this piece truly means so much to me as it commemorates the tragedy of the Holocaust. It reminds us of our humanity. Um, so I received an email. They would like to honor me with the Anne Frank uh, Award in New York. And I got to perform this piece. And um, a member of the UN Refugee Agency also came to that event. And I also treasure that award very much. And um, I always speak about Anne Frank and what education meant to her, how much she wanted to, um, you know, inspire the world with having an education. I always say it's the best weapon we could have to defeat extremism and ignorance. I just have one more question for you. You are an Aramean a Christian. Not Armenian, we, we've Not established Armenian. that, right? Yes. But an Aramean Christian. We know that Jesus spoke uh, Aramaic. And you're uh, a goodwill peace ambassador for the World Council of Arameans. Tell us a little bit about Aramean Christianity, the Aramean Christian Church, and how... Well, let's start there. Tell us a little bit about what it means to be an Aramean Christian. Tell us a little bit about what that means to you? Well, it's a very special thing. Um, I belong to the Syriac Orthodox Church, and we have here communities in the U.S., in New York, Chicago, California, maybe some other places, and also in London, U.K. <coughs> um, it's wonderful because, as you said, they speak the language of Jesus. I learned that language, the Aramaic, while I was at the elementary school. And I was able to also communicate with Johnny Messo. Uh, he's the president of World Council of Arameans in Netherlands. Uh, it also happened when I was in Syria. I was desperate to find um, any, anyone who might be interested to support me to pursue music. So I was able to find this guy who was very kind and helpful. Uh, he sponsored part of my room and board in Monmouth. And at the same time, I found a guy from Saudi Arabia who was Muslim, who also wanted to, you know, to contribute the rest. Um, so we uh, collaborated together with Johnny Messo, uh, the Syriac Orthodox guy, on some events to raise awareness about uh, Syria, the Christian in Syria, and we were able to um, push it further than this to include the rest, like Kurds, Muslims, um, Armenian people. Um, our work and the, the, the money that we raised did not only help Christians there, but also other minorities, other people in need. Uh, we spoke together at the United Nations in, in Geneva to raise awareness about what's happening in Syria and how 
we can make things better for people there. I am going to follow up with just one more question. <clears throat> You know, you look back over the trajectory of your life uh, over the last, let's say, 9, 10, 11 years. War-torn Aleppo, applying to scores of colleges trying to escape uh, uh, the violence. Uh, a young girl uh, studying violin having to leave your family and go to a foreign land, being welcomed at a university outside of Peoria, Illinois. And fast forward 10 years later, and now you're on the world stage as a goodwill peace ambassador. Uh, and like I said before, whose goal is nothing less than to heal the world and working with celebrities, raising millions of dollars, all the rest. And yet when we talked yesterday, you talked about how your faith really has guided you, has been a foundation for you, has given you courage. So I guess I want to close the interview by just asking you about the role of your faith uh, as a Christian and what that has meant to you in the last, well, your whole life, but especially these last 10 years and how you've seen the hand of God play a role in your journey. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'm truly humbled and grateful uh, to have the opportunities in the U.S., to have met people who were so supportive, kind, uh, who loved me so much and guided me. And I feel nothing happened by chance. Uh, God, uh, has led me to this people and they led them to me and um, I often think about my life and I think how death was so close and I feel that God has saved my life. God has made me to think beyond the box to from that early time in the world like to be able to find a way out he certainly had a plan for me to come here, to be able to be the voice of the voiceless, uh, to be able to at least have meaning uh, for my life again. And I would like to keep that, uh, pass it on, uh, try my best to always give back to all people who supported me and, and helped me. And, I always say, like, uh, we need to have an impact uh, because one day we'll say goodbye, but our work and reputation will eternally stay and kindness is what matters. We need to always keep our modesty. Um, and again, I'm, I'm so grateful uh, for everything that happened in my life, but I never take it for granted. I feel I must always do my best to give something to all people who supported me and um, always work hard to achieve my dreams and be able to help others who are still in need. Mariella, thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me.